Okay, I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, our next speaker. Uh, Commissioner James Wilson is uh, uh, the, the commissioner with the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba. Uh, I think I've heard Jamie speak on different occasions here at the University of Manitoba, and uh, <clears throat> He, he, he's doing uh, really important, interesting work with his colleagues at the Treaty Relations Commission. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Wilson earned his, his BA from the University of Winnipeg and Masters in Educational Administration here at the University of Manitoba. Um, he has a, a, multi, a U.S. multi-subject uh, teaching credential from California, <clears throat> excuse me, California State University in Sacramento, and also has uh, experience. Uh, teaching and an educational administration in both Canada and the U.S. Some of you may know uh, 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 Jamie, as he goes by, writes very thoughtful pieces uh, in the, the Winnipeg Free Press, including one I particularly enjoyed recently uh, on the 200th anniversary of uh, uh, the, the birth of John A. MacDonald. Was that what it was? Yeah, yeah 200th anniversary of the birth of uh, John A. MacDonald, uh, looking at the complicated legacy of our first prime minister. Um, but since 2010, he's, uh, um, he, he, in terms of his, his Aboriginal heritage, he's a traditionalist who has long advocated for the equality of women in ceremony and in leadership. And in 2010, he was appointed by the Government of Canada as the Commissioner of uh, Treaty Relations here in Manitoba. As many of you may know, the Treaty Relations Commission is a, is a neutral body that is mandated to encourage discussion and facilitate broad public understanding and enhance mutual respect between all peoples in uh, Manitoba. So please uh, welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor, uh, Commissioner James Wilson. Just a, a small correction in the, in the bio. The, the appointment is a, to my position is a joint appointment between the federal government and the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. And that's a, that, it's a, it's a pretty significant component to the job that I report both to Minister Valcour federally and to Grand Chief Nipanak here in Manitoba. Um, small, small uh, correction, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to thank thank you for the lunch. It was really good. I have to say the uh, um, gluten-free sandwiches, like all gr gluten-free bread, was a bit uh, crusty, but <laughs> I survived it. But a really good lunch, thank you very much. And uh, I wanted to thank all the presenters today and all the questions, because I've learned just a huge amount uh, being part of this, and uh, uh, it's just been a real eye-opener for me, and I'm going to uh, continue to do a lot of reading. Re really interesting subject, so. I have the pleasure of weighing in on do treaties confer basic income, or a basic income guarantee? And um, I wanted to first start, I guess, and tie this in through this concept uh, that we have through our office, uh, that we're all treaty people. So here we are on Treaty 1 land uh, in Winnipeg, Treaty 1 being signed 1871 between First Nations and the Crown, Federal Crown, and this concept of we're all treaty people and how it kind of relates. Now when, I'm, when I talk about treaties or when, when People talk about treaties, I have to preface this and qualify everything that I say uh, by saying that there's numerous perspectives, multiple perspectives on treaty. So we have the Supreme Court of Canada has perspectives on treaty, the Government of Canada, even within the Government of Canada, the Department of Justice has a perspective, then we have First Nations perspective, legal perspectives, elders perspectives, uh, histo historians have perspectives. The perspective that I want to share today is one that I think would be best exemplified by um, numerous elders. Elder Harry Bone would be a proponent of this perspective, I think. Uh, Dr. Gene Friesen, who's a, a prof from here at the University of Manitoba. And that is uh, to looking, looking at treaties as vehicles for economic security. Now, and I don't want to, I don't want to uh, disregard all the other perspectives looking at treaties as covenants, sacred covenants, the ceremony involved, all the other stuff, but I just want to look at this, this one area for today and, and kind of go a, a little bit in depth into this, 
concept of nationhood and, and economic security and how it relates to treaty, especially how it relates to our contemporary interpretation of treaty. And my, my job is not to interpret treaties. My job is to share different perspectives of treaties so we can better understand them and raise the, raise the level of context in, in, uh, in the province. Now, I, I think this perspective is best personified by a guy named uh, Big Bear. Now, Big Bear was a leader from Saskatchewan. In the late 1800s, um, very prominent leader, uh, Big Bear was uh, significant, had, Big Bear had significant kind of backroom clout, uh, strong group of followers going into negotiations for Treaty 6. And Treaty 6 is interesting because there's a number of provisions within Treaty 6 that relate to all across Canada. Now, Big Bear was, a, was the last holdout of chiefs. He's one of the first chiefs to go to the treaty negotiations, but he was one of the last holdouts to actually sign Treaty 6. So Treaty 6 was signed 1876. Big Bear held out signing until 1882. At the time of the, when the negotiations started, he had around 500 or so followers. By the time that he conceded and signed Treaty 6, through starvation, um, his number of followers had dropped down to around 100 people. Now, Big Bear was concerned about signing Treaty 6 because of a, a number of things. Now, in the first meeting with the treaty commissioners, he said, um, when you want to catch a fox, you scatter food around the trap. And then when you get the fox, the, the Fox comes to the food, you get him, and then you hammer him over the head, and that's how you kill him. He was, Big Bear was really concerned that the treaties would create some form of dependency on the government. So he, he took a very strong nation-to-nation -nation approach in dealing with, with the federal crown. And he felt that any provisions within treaty that would infringe on that nationhood and that self-determination and that sovereignty um, would slowly lead to dependence in, in First Nations. Now through uh, numerous federal policies, some of which uh, instituted by Sir Johnny MacDonald, I, I talked about in that article, James Dashuk's written a really brilliant piece called uh, Clearing, Clearing the Plains. It's a, it's a book on the use of uh, starvation tactics back, basically to move people out of the way of the, uh, the railroad. Um, Big Bear finally conceded and met with the treaty commissioners and agreed to sign Treaty 6. But he, he, he demanded that one provision be put into the, the, the terms of the treaty. And in Treaty 6, there's a term basically that food shall be provided to the First Nations. He insisted that the, the clause um, in times of famine, it has to do with famine. He wanted the word in times of famine to be included in there because he felt if just food was provided openly, then it would, again, create this dependency that would cause First Nations to become dependent on the federal government. Now, there's a number of provisions within Treaty 6 that are, uh, I, I think, really relevant, um, interesting to, our, to today's dialogue. There's another provision within Treaty 6 that talks about the uh, medicine chest. The medicine chest is a, this, this goes back actually all the way to First Nations interacting with the Hudson Bay Company. Uh, hundreds of years ago, the Hudson Bay Company, when they met with the First Nations to trade furs for goods, would go through sometimes days of protocols before they would actually get down to trading. Pipe ceremonies, gift exchange, all that. One of the things that the Hudson Bay Company did is they would give a medicine chest to the First Nations and they would teach them about the medicines in there. First Nations adopted a lot, or Hudson Bay Company adopted a lot of the treaty making protocols that First Nations carried with them. So in the time of treaty across uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, um, there was First Nations that requested, and in fact, Hudson Bay Company representatives to be there because they said, these guys know how to do business with us. They've adopted our business practices and uh, the, the medicine chest clause was one of them. So the medicine chest clause basically says everyone will have access to health care. Well, I guess that would, that would, the modern interpretation would be from First Nations that everybody has access to health care, that the chiefs negotiated that we will give you access to this land 
and the riches on this land, in exchange, we want certain things. We want a medicine chest and training in how to use the medicine chest. Jump forward to 2015, that's interpreted as access to health care. A uh, hundred years before Tommy Douglas, First Nations are saying, we want the health needs of all of our people to be taken care of as a, as a part of this agreement. Um, agriculture is another area where the First Nations requested training, um, seeds, and supplies to um, go into a farming economy. So First Nations saw the, the drastically changing environment. Uh, buffalo populations were largely depleted. So they saw the treaties, and, and the elders will constantly emphasize this, that the treaties are not about handouts, it's about opportunities. So they saw the treaties as a means to create opportunities to adapt. So they requested things like um, training in agriculture, agricultural equipment. There's a number of communities that really thrived in the agricultural area. And uh, right around, actually around Surus here in Manitoba, there's a number of First Nations that did quite well. They invested in communal property and farming equipment. Um, and they made that, that rough transition from some of them from a hunter-gatherer society to a, a farming society. The other, another uh, provision that was included was uh, education. So First Nations said, it, once again, we'll give you access to the land. In exchange, we want a, a teacher and a school in our community. And a lot of times that education was, um, became part of the negotiations from the First Nations. The First Nations put it into the negotiations. Not, uh, you'll note, it's a school and a teacher on the reserve too. Um, the, the text of the numbered treaties, there's 11 numbered treaties in Western Canada, all roughly says Her Majesty will provide a school and teacher to the Indians when they shall desire it. Bas basically language like that. And then there's also provisions for uh, hunting, being able to hunt and fish and trap on all traditional territories for um, if the hunting and the fishing fails or there's a bad season, there's provisions in a number of the numbered treaties that have to do with uh, providing foods, um, as I mentioned, flour, sugar, um, snare wire, um, uh, ammunition, gunpowder. Uh, so this whole livelihood concept, and, I, and again, if, if you think about First Nations negotiating to be able to hunt and fish and trap during a time when uh, the trapping economy was probably one of the largest economies in the West. So it's, it's a pretty significant part of the negotiations. So since, since then, um, so we, let me back up a bit. Um, so we have this concept of the treaties as being about economic agreements, right? It's about this whole concept of livelihood. Uh, and it, it, it's a fairly, um, I don't want to say it's a fairly uh, new interpretation of the treaties, but it's being talked about more and more. Um, we talked a little bit about the Supreme Court earlier, uh, about Aboriginal law real quickly. Aboriginal law in Canada is probably the, the fastest changing, the fastest growing area of law in the country. Um, we have a lot of the dialogue being led by the Supreme Court and that kind of filtering down through some of the politics that's happening across the country. But this whole concept of livelihood and researchers and elders talking about this whole concept of livelihood is a, is a fairly recent, within the past five years, it's really come to the forefront. So, and, and we're still trying to figure out what exactly does that mean? And I think that relates to today's dialogue. Now, um, the treaties, if you listen to the historians, to the elders, um, to the legal experts, were imperfect yet uh, meaningful ways where people with different worldviews figured out a way to work together, right? And to create enduring relationships of mutual obligation. Now since then, we know that relationship hasn't evolved the way that both parties wanted it to at the beginning. And there's the, the, the major contributing factor to that is the Indian Act. So the Indian Act is introduced by the government. Simultaneously to them negotiating the treaties, the government is creating a piece of legislation unilaterally with no consultation. 
that governs everything that happens on reserve um, and really creates, it puts a damper on all economic development. Um, it uh, thwarts any sense of livelihood or independence or self-sufficiency or this whole nation concept that, that Big Bear pushed for. The Indian Act, um, real, real quickly to go through, and, and it's important to understand the difference between the Indian Act and treaties. Uh, the Indian Act basically is where the residential school era comes in through the Indian Act. Um, the past system comes in through the Indian Act. Um, the, uh, the vote gets taken away from First Nations through the Indian Act. Um, it becomes illegal for lawyers in Canada to represent First Nations clients against the Crown through the Indian Act, unless you have the Crown's approval, of course. Um, the peasant farmer policy gets introduced through the Indian Act. So it was a policy that said uh, these First Nations, like the ones around Suris, that were doing really well in farming, were advancing too fast, and they were setting themselves up for failure. So they, the government, in its wisdom, said, uh, we're outlawing the use of labor-saving farming equipment for First Nations. So uh, First Nations could only farm with uh, hand tools, handmade hand tools. Uh, so an industry and, a, and a businesses that were thriving were basically crippled overnight because of the peasant farmer policy. Sarah Carter, who did her doctorate here at the University of Manitoba, writes about that in a book called uh, Lost Harvest. Really, really interesting read. And it's not, uh, so all of these policies are introduced. I mean, a lot of them are changed to bring us into line with uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Like over time, the Indian Act has been adopted, or adopted and changed. But the, um, the overall stature of the, the and, and the overall impact of the Indian Act remains, and I, I think a really good example of how that remains today would be uh, Shoal Lake. Um, one sec. So Shoal Lake, for those of you that are unfamiliar, or Shoal Lake 40, it's, it's sometimes called because there's actually two communities right next to each other, two reserves, Shoal Lake 39 and Shoal Lake 40. Shoal Lake 40 is a community about two hours east of Winnipeg. It's on a beautiful big lake. And the lake is a, uh, so all of the, uh, not all of the, but significant part of the White Shell and Falcon Lake development area, or lakes, feeds into Shoal Lake. Uh, it's a beautiful lake, and that's where the city of Winnipeg gets our water from. We get our water from Shoal Lake. So in 1914, the city of Winnipeg decided that we wanted to be the Chicago of the North, and uh, that to be the Chicago of the North, our water supply had to be just supreme, and we had to have access to uh, lots of really good water. Uh, it was really hard to use water out of the, out of the Red and the Assiniboine because of the sediment. So they said, okay, we're going to ship water in or pipe water in from Shoal Lake. It's, I think, 350 feet above us, so it, it's all downhill. Um, what they did is the, the community of Shoal Lake was on a really beautiful bay, and they were forcibly removed onto a peninsula of the lake, and where the, uh, where the Falcon Lakes area feeds into Shoal Lake, so there's lots of sediment where it feeds in, the city built a dam. And then where Shoal Lake is on a peninsula, they built a, a channel along the peninsula and redirected all that, all that water and kind of to keep the pristineness of the water that's going into the aqueduct to, to the city of Winnipeg. So the community was forcibly relocated. Uh, they were cut off by this channel. Uh, and for a period of, of about up until the 80s, 1980s, they remained somewhat self-sufficient because they relied on the um, um, commercial fishing in Shoal Lake. 1980s come along and there's concerns from Winnipeg about fishing in Shoal Lake because they feel it might affect the waters. So the government of Canada outlaws or I think it was the government and the provinces of Manitoba and Ontario outlawed commercial fishing in Shoal Lake. So the community was basically put into a state where it, people that had livelihood 
they had had to sign up for welfare. It was the only way, basically, they could uh, get any income at all. Um, they looked at cabin developments on the to generate revenue, and the the governments both outlawed that. Um, so now, because as development in Falcon Lakes area increases, the runoff from there, um, and it's increased and it's affected the water quality that's going into this dammed off area, and the Show Lake gets its water from that area, so they can't they can't deal with the impact of the sediment and all the pol pollution in that water. So they've been under a boil water advisory now, I think, for 18 years. Um, anything they get onto the reserve, because they're basically land, it's a man-made island. Um, they can't, you can't get onto the reserve except in the winter, unless you take a barge in the summer. Everything there is really, really expensive. And they can hear the Trans-Canada Highway. You can hear the Trans-Canada Highway from the reserve. That's how close they are to the Trans-Canada Highway, yet they're completely locked uh, from access to it. Uh, so it, it, we're talking about historic issues, but they're contemporary issues at the same time. Um, and, um, and we have uh, what the chief, Chief Red Sky from Show Lake is saying, what they want is basically a road built, and all they call it Freedom Road, a road built from their island up to the Trans-Canada Highway at a cost of $30 million, quite minimal. They've got buy-in from the city of Winnipeg uh, and the province, but uh, the last, they can't, they can't get the uh, federal government. There's dispute over, the problem lies in one riding and the solution rides in a different riding. So we've, there's some politicking going on about who, who basically pays for the, the federal one-third of that, uh, that road construction. So we're dealing with issues that are very historic in nature, but we're faced with them daily in, in, in Manitoba, especially on First Nations. Um, this whole concept of um, basic income guarantee and what, what does it mean and what does it mean under a treaty context. Now, I, I think the way forward from this is uh, delving into and understanding better this whole concept of uh, resource equity. And how am I doing for time here? A few more minutes, five minutes? So resource equity, if I go back to the perspective shared by Big Bear, that First Nations as independent, sovereign communities, self-reliant, um, not looking for handouts. It's this concept of, uh, res you might have heard of the term resource revenue sharing. Uh, resource revenue sharing is one kind of sub-argument sub within the whole resource equity uh, dialogue. Basically, resource equity says, um, and, it, and this, is a, this is an issue that deals really with, it has to do with treaties, but it, also, it just has to do with plain fairness. If, uh, if you're a community and you have a sig significant amount of wealth coming out of your backyard, it's through fairness that you should have a part of that wealth. Uh, revenue is only one part of that wealth, though, that gets generated out of, that, out of resource development in Canada. And I think that's why there's a difference between the concept of resource revenue sharing and resource equity. There's, there's, uh, there's jobs, there's taxation, there's uh, licensing fees, there's all, all kinds of different levels of wealth that can be generated out of uh, resource development in Canada. We have First Nations leaders now throughout Canada that are saying, um, if we want to become self-reliant, independent communities again, um, that this is one way that we can do it. Uh, the Show Lake example, the city of Winnipeg makes $22 million a year off of the water that it ships in from Show Lake. Show Lake is saying, out of fairness, it would be nice if we could have a portion of that, those profits, and those are, those are profits, I've been told, um, that we could have a share of those profits to help us create some independence as a community. That's one, that's one example. Um, in the north, we've got 
numerous uh, mining development, hydro, uh, forestry projects where the First Nations are saying this, all of this stuff is happening on our traditional lands. We're the ones that are paying the long-term uh, cost of this and taking the long-term risks, especially around the environment. We're, gonna, we're the ones that are going to have to have, have to deal with this when this mine picks up and leaves. So in order to mitigate that, and we want to say in how this is developed, and we want to say in how we move forward with this. Um, so that's one area. The other area that I think is maybe most relevant to guaranteed income would be this concept of annuities that was attached to a lot of the treaties. Uh, treaties 1 and 2, there was uh, annuities given out of $3. Firstly, it was $3, and then Treaty 3 was signed. They, First Nations there were given $5. Um, the First Nations of Treaties 1 and 2 at one point refused to accept the money, and it forced the government to come back to the table. Um, First Nations view this $5. So all across Canada, uh, Treaty First Nations, they have the ceremonies called Treaty Days, where you'll see the Government of Canada shows up, briefcases full of brand new $5 bills, RCMP's there in their red surge, Chief and Council's there. It's, it's a real symbolic ceremony where the government will give, uh, usually, so the RCMP officer representing the Crown will hand over $5 to the First Nation band member. Uh, it's really, First Nations viewed as a symbol of renewing the treaty relationship on a yearly basis. Now some people look at this again as a supplement to if hunting fails, if trapping fails, if everything else fails, there's this money that was agreed to in 1871. I'm, I mean, 1871, five dollars was a lot different than, eight, than what it is now. There's been some people that have looked at what would that mean today. Uh, but there are some people that are looking at that maybe as a, a system of, is that some kind of form of guaranteed income? Uh, it, it, I, I think it's really worth exploring. I'm not going to answer that, I guess, if you're looking at me to answer it. But So I'll say it's, it's worth exploring. Um, there's a whole bunch of areas here that are really, uh, to me, I'm really interested in. And I'm really interested in... Uh, the whole, and I'm hoping somebody at the University of Manitoba here is or is going to be doing research into the economics of treaty and the um, economic changes related to treaty and how that, you know, from 1871, 1876, all the way to 2015, and what are these changing um, approaches and changing perspectives? How do they influence how we view treaties today? Uh, so, I guess finally I'll conclude with the, the, I've been talking to different people about this concept. What does it mean, you know, do treaties confer basic income? And uh, the, the most interesting uh, comment I heard from a friend of mine was, well, yeah, the Canada's had a basic income off of our land for over 140 years. Um, the, the term bounty and benevolence is used in the treaties through the Queen's bounty and benevolence, you know, her subjects will receive the following kind of thing. And uh, there's a growing uh, discourse about the bounty and benevolence being from First Nations people. So the, the, the wealth that's been shared through access to the land has, has been a significant benefit to the country. Um, and by by recognizing that, I think I think that's a really valuable first step. Just recognizing that that uh, First Nations were were I mean I mean the treaties were really the building blocks of this country, and uh, recognizing that the the contributions that First Nations made helps us to get to where we can start kind of healing this relationship that I think has become quite fractured of, of late. So thank you very much. Can I say I don't know? Am I allowed to? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, I'm assuming First Nations would want to exercise that authority themselves. <laughs>
I know there's any, any time that the prob so the relationship, First Nations view the relationship is between themselves and the federal, well, some between the British Crown, but between the, 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 the big crown, right? The Supreme Court has said this, with this most recent decision that the crown is the crown and it divvies up its obligations, how it sees fit kind of thing. Um, but anytime the province, anytime that the, the implementation of uh, services moves from the feds to the province, many First Nations view that as an infringement of that relationship. So um, a lot of First Nations would want to implement that themselves at the, at the community level. I don't know if that answers your question. Just a quick point to add there, uh, at a basic income conference we had three or four years ago in New York, uh, one of our speakers was uh, chief, uh, former AFN chief over at Mercury, and I think it's pertinent to your question. I mean, he did kind of raise the, the warning of, you know, First Nations have had this relationship with the Crown, especially under the Indian Act, where, I mean, welfare payments became kind of an instrument of colonialism, in yeah. a sense. Okay, I think there, there's so much there to think about and uh, hopefully the dialogue will continue. So uh, I really thank 